Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The View. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're very excited to have um, a bunch of guests on The View today, which uh, usually we, we only get two or three, but today we've got four. So this is really exciting for us. Thank you so much. I'm going to introduce our guests in just a minute. But first, I wanted to give our regular View hosts a chance to um, introduce themselves. I'm Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from the beautiful uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where our spring has finally sprung. We're very, very excited about that. I don't want to rub it in too, uh, too much because I know that's not the case for a bunch of folks. Uh, so speaking of which, Meg Riley. Hey there. Welcome to my world. We've got nine inches of slushy, disgusting, cement-like snow surrounding the house. It was, uh, it was the worst shoveling last night of the year. It was every shovel full weighed like a ton. So I'm a lot of people are just waiting for it to melt, which it will be doing about a week. But that meanwhile makes it really hard for people to walk. So I'll be out there later. I don't, you know, you don't get snow days when you work from home. All the schools are closed. All my teacher friends are having snow days. So I lit a fire. That's how I'm honoring a snow day. And my dog's here. My dog's having a snow day. <laughs> Marga Lee, where are you today? Hello. So glad to be back. Um, I am in Connecticut, Cromwell, Connecticut, to be specific. I will be um, looking at um, how you're chatting with us on Facebook and we'll, if you have questions, comments, I'll make sure that our panelists and guests have, um, have your questions. And I will also be um, tweeting and all that good stuff. So glad to be here. Weather-wise, it's sunny. I'm looking out, out the window here, very sunny here and weather's been really nice. I'm even tempted not to turn on my heat. So, all right, back to you, Christina. That sounds really, really good for us. Um, so at the top of the hour at The View, we usually do a little bit of a UU roundup. Um, we don't have a lot on tap for today, except I'll give a shout out to all of the folks who are in search, who are, um, you know, having their, their um, candidate um, spaces announced and all of the folks that are going into second search, many blessings on you. We know that this all can be really stressful. Um, so just really want to say it's, it's all, it's all good. Everybody will get where they need to go. We, we have faith in y'all. Um, and right now, uh, the DRE search, search for religious professionals really start, uh, re religious educators really starts to heat up as well. So, um, just a shout out to all those folks as well. Um, I'll, I'll else? throw in, uh, um, a thing here. I wanted to recognize that Paige wanted to describe something that Blue is doing, which is very exciting. Go for it. I was ready to do the shameless plug whenever I was asked. So gotta tell y'all, if you haven't seen already, um, Blue is doing a campaign um, that's called Babies and Bailouts. So this is an opportunity for our folks um, not just you use, but faith folks in general, folks in the community to really skill up and understand how the um, how mass incarceration works and particularly how the cash bail system works. Um, we're doing this in solidarity with National Bailout, with Song, with various organizers and organizations, groups, collectives that are working to get um, Black Mamas free for the Black Mamas Day bailout that's happening on Mother's Day. So. The ask is simple, gather your folks, two, three, five, a whole congregation's worth of people. All you have to do is go online on Facebook, open up our Facebook, um, Black Lives UU, and watch our little watch party. We have some tips, we have some post-panel discussions that y'all can do. And really, we, wanna we want us to be able to raise as much funds to get, to get mothers out to be reunited with their kids and their family members as possible. So, if that's something that you're interested in, you can just sign up. It's blacklivesuu.com slash babies. It's all over our social media. You should be able to find it real quick. And I just made an announcement about one of our illustrious panelists. So if you check out Blue's um, Facebook page, you'll be able to find out who that is. So that's the plug. Yeehaw, I'm going to head over and see who that is. Now I'm curious. Um, thanks so much for that, Paige. Um, 
I wanted to circle back to a conversation that we had last week. So on last week's view, um, Aisha and I were talking about um, one of the panelists that had been um, invited to speak at Revolutionary Love. And that was really problematic. And I wanted to kind of close that loop, circle that, that closed and say that the uh, person um, uh, had been uh, disinvited from, from speaking, had been invited to attend. Um, some of the wording around that was, was problematic. They were invited to attend as a quote unquote pilgrim. Um, in learning more um, about LGBTQ um, uh, issues and affirmations. So, you know, still work there to be done, um, but I think it was um, really successful in really shining a light on who are we centering when we're talking about um, revolutionary love? Who are we centering when we're talking about how to get free? And who whose voices are we um, centering and resourcing um, when we're having these conversations and that it's just as critical to ask those questions um, as it is to have those, um, to have these spaces for us to, to hear people. Um, Revolutionary Love was, was really well attended. Um, it's really well attended by Unitarian Universalists. And, um, you know, certainly going forward for next year, I think that there's some critical thought that needs to happen around the process that allowed that person to make it all the way to the speaking panels and be, um, you know, be publicized as somebody that was speaking. Um, I think, you know, looking into the institutional ways and systemic ways that that is happening is also super important. And so since we're talking about systemic and institutional um, um, issues, we invited um, our four panelists and I'm going to go through um, and just read our introductions for them. And then I want you all to say hello. Um, Sana Saeed is the co-vice president of DRUM, which is Digress Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. Um, she's currently serving as chaplain at the University of Pennsylvania, working with undergraduate and graduate students on campus. She's also the intern minister for the UMA, which is the UU Ministers Association, and a re recent graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Yep. Um, Paige Ingram is a Southern and Midwestern based Black Muslim UU troublemaker and faith-rooted organizer and abolitionist. Um, her call is to nurture emergent spaces where people can authentically connect in ways that heal and totally reimagine their communities. Paige is a community organizer with Black Lives of UU. She's a fellow with the Lord's Work of Southerners on New Ground, co-founder of the Half Moon Healing House in Greensboro, North Carolina. Shout out to Greensboro. Um, Anti-racism trainer with Resist You, a freelance facilitator, speaker, and collage artist. I didn't know that last part. All right, learn something new all the time. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ranwa Hamani is uh, president of DRUM and a community minister affiliated with the Mount Diablo UU Church in California. Shout out to California. Um, they serve as the executive director of the UU Justice Ministry of California. So excited about that, didn't even tell you. Um, organizer and supporter of California UUs in the work of creating a just and equitable California. She's also co-editor of the proposed Muslim Voices in Unitarian Universalism, along with our fourth guest, who is Tynan Power. Um, Tynan is a transgender Muslim leader and activist, and a member of Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence in Northampton, Massachusetts, bringing it all the way back around to the other side of the country, right on. Thank you all so much for coming on The View today. We're really, really excited um, to have you here. Um, our, our focus today on The View is um, Muslim UUs, Unitarian Universalists. Um, I, I think I wanted to start it off with Sana and, and Renwa because you two most recently did um, have an open letter to Unitarian Universalism. And I was just wondering if you could share you know, what prompted that, 
and uh, you know just a little bit about the process around that. Uh, Sana, do you want to start the story? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, so we were, uh, I think, we were both at the Finding Our Way Home conference um, at this past month. It's already April. Woof. Um, and uh, that, and while we were there, um, the the terrorist attack on the the mosques at Christchurch in New Zealand happened. Um, and so we, um, we both sort of were supporting each other via text and in person. And then, um, as some of the UU responses were coming out around that, um, it was, I think, Sana that, uh, recognized that there were some maybe problematic pieces of our, uh, UU response in particular, some of the things that were on our worship web was one space and, um it kind of it was the icing on a heavily frosted cake that um sort of prompted this response you know uh the with the unitarian universalism being in this place of <laughs> growing self-awareness of the ways in which we have colonized and um harmed and misappropriated from different cultures and communities um the islamic traditions are not an exception to that and uh we finally felt like it was time for us there was an opportunity also for us to um really call unitarian universalists in um and to identify the ways in which this is a, a place where this happens um and so the the two of us uh, uh we drafted the statement um and we actually ran into the struggle of being able to find a, a concrete community to run it by. I think part of the struggle with being a UU Muslim or a Muslim in UU spaces is that we're not aware of where each other are or where each other is. It's early on the West Coast, so my grammar is going to be what it is. Um, <laughs> and uh, we we had a, a Facebook community that is slowly growing that we were able to um, post it in to share to see um, if folks had feedback or had any additional input. Um, but we recognize that, you know, it largely came from words that we put together. And while there was support and appreciation in the group, we know that it doesn't represent everybody. Um, we made that attempt, but as much as it's possible to reach out to everybody um, when we don't have the capacity to organize ourselves at the moment um, or the resources to do so. Um, we decided that we were going to put this out and um, really encourage Unitarian Universalists to take a hard look at what it means to be in relationship with Muslims, with UU Muslims, um, and with the Islamic traditions. Uh, yeah, Sana, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. Thanks, Ranwa. Um, you covered a lot of um, a lot of what happened, and I think um, one of the things that I wanted to also lift up is um, the invitation to invite Paige and Tynan and others is to bring in more diverse UU Muslim voices in this conversation. Um, so I think one of the things that I really appreciate about um, you know, releasing the statement um, and where we're at now is this opportunity to kind of start growing the community and connecting and building relationships um, where there can be transparency and accountability and also um, address some of the larger problems that we're seeing when it comes to how Unitarian Universalists are using Muslim resources <laughs> and scripture. Um, and just the ways they're connecting with Muslims. So I was I was actually struck by um, one of the things that of your beautiful blessing to us all, which is this letter that that you all gave to us, um, was actually the title it, um, about us without us. Um, and I was wondering if you all could speak a little bit more about that because. Um, I think sometimes that is the crux of um, 
when Unitarian Universalists seek to, I think what they're trying to do is honor, um, but go right into misappropriation. Uh, yeah, so that's actually a title that has been stirring in my mind for a lot of things related to Unitarian Universalism. Um, and uh, in particular, um, the, the, the sense that there are obviously more often than not good intentions when it comes to wanting to engage difference, wanting to engage um, things that uh, are not necessarily um, an a community or individual's culture or identity. Um, but it's, it is um, an exoticism that can sometimes happen. There um, can be the decontexting of uh, a, a community or an individual's experience when um, there are things written about or written for um, communities without actually being in direct relationship. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, as somebody that does work with social justice and Unitarian Universalists, one of the things I always want to encourage is ongoing relationship and not just the sort of the reactive solidarity that we'll, we'll often see when it comes to justice making, but what does it look like to just be in ongoing relationship with communities, even and especially not in times of explicit crisis? And I think that's when we can have some of the more, the deeper relationships, the, you know, the, the greater understanding and appreciation for um, each other's identities and experiences um, and the gifts that we all bring. Um, and the about us without us is something for this particular, um, for the experience of Unitarian Universalist Muslims and uh, Muslims in UU spaces, there's a lot written about us without us. And I think that, you know, we have, there are a lot of texts, there are, um, you know, reflections and things that don't necessarily come from uh, Muslims or UU Muslims uh, and will take from the Islamic traditions and Muslim experiences without um, consultation or real concrete awareness of what's coming, where it's coming from. And um, I know that was something that, um, Sana did a little bit of research too around um, a couple of worship pieces that we thought were would have been better if they had been in relationship, um, as far as we could tell, uh, with Muslim communities. Um, and that was, uh, again, something that prompted that what would happen if we did this in relationship with each other on an ongoing basis. I uh, wanted to ask uh, Paige. You, you move in so many circles just, you know, before the, uh, we started the show, I had asked you, wow, you're, you're always on the move. And so I wanted you to speak to your experience as a UU Muslim, like what, what has that been like for you? Thank you for that question. Um, I think that it's something that I find myself constantly interrogating. Um, so I think for me, what has been interesting is that really my first entry point into UU spaces was through Blue. Um, and so I think for, for a while, I was both like heavily invested in, in, in this smaller community and looking at Blue as kind of like a model for what is possible in terms of what just like really trying to like gather people together, um, gather a very non-monolithic community with various, uh, you know, faith traditions, belief systems, spiritual traditions into a space and find a way to create a spiritual home um, with pe people from like all of these different backgrounds who have, who have like a common thread of being, of being identified, like identifying as black. So when I, um, when I first went to GA, which was in New Orleans a few, a couple of years ago, I was like, I felt myself being simultaneously very full from from blue, but also missing something because there is there is like this other very strong um, uh, 
part of my identity, my, my spiritual identity, but also just like informing the way that I navigate in the world and how people look at me and what people think about me, but also just like, and, and, and that wasn't there. Um, and so I remember just kind of like asking around like, Hey, are, like, are, like, are there any Muslim people? Like, like, am I going to run into anyone? So I'm literally like navigating in this space that just feels very white. And I was forewarned warned about that and looking for people that I, that I'm not even sure exists while at the same time, um, having very strange interactions where people are kind of like, you know, touching my hijab and asking me questions about, you know, how, how am I like rectifying like my, my theology with Unitarian Universalism. And so I'm thinking like, um, A, I felt like I was winging it and I'm like, I'm still trying to process this and I'm doing it and I'm doing it alone and I don't want to, but I feel like I have to. Um, and so, you know, I think that I'm still as, as deeply involved as I'm in with, with, with UU community, I'm still very new and I'm still, and I'm still learning and I'm still realizing, um, I think, I'm, I think that I'm, I'm recognizing a need across the board for, for you use to do more deeper interrogation about, about theology, about, about the sources, right? So everyone's talking about the principles and I'm like, okay, like, like, what are these sources? And, um, and, 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 and how do these Muslim sources fit, fit into this, um, this uh this 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 uu covenant this uu ideology and what are what do people actually know about this and do people actually recognize like that 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 my faith community and that and that and that my theology is also informing yours um so i think all in all i'm still i'm in a constant place of contemplation interrogation reflection and I'm, I'm happy to have people in my community that I can talk to but at the same time man I would just I would love to have a congregational prayer you know what I'm saying on a Friday like that would be amazing I would love to like have like some super deep theological conversations that like need to be had overall in the community but specifically for us and you know I think I think that that what has happened in this moment is what I'm hoping is that people are going to come out and we can just collect each other and not wait and just like, and, and, and figure it out as we go along and find the beauty in that process. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think it would be wonderful if uh, the view could do that, could help or at least help bring um, other uh, Muslims who are watching this, you, you Muslim who are watching this together. And I have the same question for you, Tynan. Tynan. I know you put Ty there. Is that okay for me to refer to you as Ty? I have the same question for you, what your experience has been like as a UU Muslim. Um, so, I, you know, I feel like my experience as a UU Muslim has, has varied over time um, in the, the different ways that uh, my Muslim identity has been more in the forefront or less in the forefront. Um, but I definitely, um, I, I really uh, agree with, um, with the, this, this idea that, that there is frequently a lot of um, interest in Islam and sort of um, bringing in teachings or bringing in speakers even from outside of um, the Unitarian Universalist congregation. Um, that are not necessarily, um, you know, talking to the people that are, you know, in the within the UU, and not not talking to Muslims in the congregation, and also not seeming to be talking to any Muslims in the wider UU world. Um, and so there's like a disjoint where we, what frequently, in in my experience, has ended up getting presented ends up being this very monolithic view. Of um, of Islam and a very um, sometimes um, like very depersonalized, definitely, but also um, so some really problematic things. Um, so, for just as an example of the kind of thing that can come up 
um, is that, you know, in response to uh, the, the massacre in Christchurch, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of different congregations of different faiths that have really stepped up to support the Muslim community, um, which is incredibly important and very valuable. Um, and I would not by any means say that they shouldn't do that, that that's excellent, but it shouldn't stop there. And that um, there really needs to be more of an understanding that, that the Muslims in a community are not just the people that are showing up at a particular mosque on Friday, that the Muslims are, you know, including people that are members of other sects that are not mainstream Muslim sects and therefore aren't necessarily going to what is usually the mainstream sects mosque in the area. Um, for example, in our area, um, it is the nearest Shia mosque is two hours away from where I live. So people that identify as Shiite Muslims are not necessarily going to their mosque. And then they're certainly not going to the local one that is not of the same sect. Um, but then we also have people like me who are LGBTQ and Muslims who don't necessarily feel welcome in traditional Muslim congregation spaces and therefore um, showing support for those mainstream Muslim organizations sometimes comes at the price of not also including uh, people who are experiencing alienation or isolation, but who are still experiencing a great deal of, uh, you know, personal grief and response um, and maybe experiencing Islamophobia in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so, you know, I definitely feel like a, a huge factor for me has been, you know, really, you know, kind of watching um, most uh, Unitarian Universalist uh, communities that I'm that I'm connected to in any way, supporting um, really versions of my Muslim faith that don't resonate for me. Um, I, I will say that I was very fortunate when I started um, attending the Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence that the director of religious education at that time did a really fantastic job of including me and my family in, for example, planning how they were going to teach about Islam in religious education. Um, and actually, my oldest child and I started teaching in the neighboring faiths curriculum about Islam from the point that they were in uh, ninth grade. So, you know, that was like an ongoing role that we had in being able to have some, some voice in the way that that was presented. Um, so that was, that was an example of kind of doing it right. Um, but I definitely see a lot of, you know, people with really, really good intentions and really, really good, um, you know, good thinking and good, good general ideology just, just kind of missing the mark by not actually being more in direct contact with Muslims that they're actually trying to reach. Which kind of leads us to, you know, some of what we've been talking about really here on The View for the past three, four weeks, um, you know, before finding our way home and, and, and certainly has been a, an ongoing conversation in Unitarian Universalism for, for much longer than that of um, how do we shift institutionally um, the way in which different groups, mar different mar groups of marginalized identities are in engaged? Um, because, you know, certainly the, the, uh, the UU world, uh, magazine uh, that came out that that had um, the article about transgender issues, you know, to go to Ronwa's point of, you know, talk about us without us, that was huge. <laughs> um, but in that same in that same magazine, in that very same issue, there was also, you know, a a um, article about neurodivergent. Um, you use without, you know. A, centering somebody with that identity. Um, there was actually another one that I now I can't even recall. And, and this is this is like an ongoing trend. So I think you're right, Tynan, that that there is a lot of um, uh, goodwill, you know, and some genuinely um, good intent, but that intent impact continually um, misses the mark. And, and that's to me where I see the institutional part of it needing to really be analyzed of 
how does this how is this allowed and encouraged in some ways to continue to happen because we're you know this group of six of us on this episode seven of us on this episode um are not the first to you know talk about this you know we talk about in drum um you know we have elders in drum and we have elders in blue uh we have elders in in uh, trust who say you know this these are the same things that we've been talking about for generations now um so what do you all have to say about that institutional piece of it I'm happy to start. I, I think I, I feel like, like I think about this a lot. Um, I think the first, the first thing for me that I think is really important is supporting. If if, if we're using if we're using Muslim youth as an example, supporting them and creating an autonomous space for them to be able for us, you know to be able to, to do the things that, that we need to do for our own spiritual nourishment that's like not necessarily under the gaze of people who don't, who like don't understand or who are going to center themselves in that process. I think that that's really, really important. Um, I'll say like in, in the organizing that I, that I do with Blue, I like people have told me that like having that space has actually made their experiences with the rest for the rest of the wider community more beneficial. They're able to, they're able to, to stand in their truth because they have a community of people who, who inherently under, under I mean, for the most part, inherently understand um, what their experience is, what their cultural context is. And so they can really get at, at, at the crux of, of what they're needing for their own spiritual nourishment. Um, I think that another thing, partially that I've been trying to tackle um, is interrogating congregational culture, particularly when it comes to like social justice oriented issues. Um, I think often to run West point, folks will wait until a crisis moment to try to build a bridge. And that's just not how relationships are built. Um, I think often you'll, you'll have a congregation where there's like one or two social justice people who take on kind of like pet projects and there's not buy-in from leadership. There's not buy-in from the community, from the congregation. And so like, if, if there's going to be any move in creating a cultural sh a, a cultural shift from a congregational perspective, forget about the entire UUA, but like just starting off small and like where is where are people's first contact with Unitarian Universalism? It's not at GA. It's not at whatever other gathering. It's it's typically at a church. So what are, so like what can we do to try to shift that and to make people feel like the issues that are important to them actually matter to the people in their community and not just some sort of like hot button thing to grab onto. Um, I mean, for me, I'm just like, it's 2019. So whatever that we were doing three years ago, that was cute, but a lot of things have shifted. And I think that, that the conversations that we're having, even over the last year, like, the fact that we're having this conversation right now is 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 indicative of like us being able to like recognize i think at times fault lines or you know just just issues that that are coming up where people feel empowered enough to actually be able to bring it up so like what can we do in our what well, what can we do in a local context to empower people to make the decisions that they need as individuals or as a small community to be able to feel empowered in, in their UU identity, as well as in their Muslim identity, as well as in their whatever identity and be able to hold all of that. And I think for the most part, people don't really feel like they can bring them whole, their whole selves into a, into a church setting. I know that I don't, I, I'll sit in a congregation and be like, 
this, like, this is not relevant to me, like on, on any level. And so I'm, and so I go to, I go to support or I go for, you know, a general sense of community, but I know that I need my spiritual nourishment fed in a completely different way. Um, and so what can we do to, to allow people an opportunity to actually do that in a communal setting as you use? Um, I think something that's coming up for me is uh, on top of what Paige has shared and others have shared in, in um, their feet comments. Um, I think the part of the reactionary solidarity that is really bothering me is that there's this need to create prayers and resources that focus on how Muslims are peaceful. Um, and it, to me, that speaks of Islamophobia because it's, it's like, of course, we're peaceful. <laughs> Why does that need to be emphasized? Um, you know, whenever something violent happens. So I think if there was, you know, a relationship and there was engagement with Muslims that isn't around times of when bad things happen or violent things happen, there will be more diversity in the type of resources present that wouldn't just be focused on peace. Um, and that's what I feel like is really missing um, and could be a starting point to work on systemically even within um, UU communities. That's a really profound point. I mean, I just think of the number of services, posts, and everything that I've been part of. I mean, I will say that your, um, your post really made me think about the number of times that I've used Rumi or Hafiz or somebody without contextualizing at all. And it also made me remember when I was in the Washington office, the State Department would bring people from around the world. I don't know who they were, God only knows. But um, Every year, I, the UUA office got added to this tour because the, there were a lot of Middle Eastern Muslims who really wanted to talk about theology on really deep levels and read about Unitarian Universalism and were really intrigued by the, the theological content of it. And I mean, nobody else in all my years in the Washington office, no one else ever visited who wanted to talk so deeply about theology. And it, it just made me think, and Paige said this earlier, that some really deep theological reflection would be a gift to all of us. I think um, we had a show years ago with Ibrahim Farjaje, uh, dearly departed, um, talking about the history and all of the gifts that Islam brought to Unitarian Universalism, many of which I will say I knew nothing about, nothing about. And so I feel like unless you happen to take a seminary class or something, I, I don't know where people are, are learning this, but I've been a UU all my life and I never, I, you know, so I just think theological and also historical curriculum for one thing would be really for, for adults and for young people would be extremely useful. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up that story because, you know, one of my favorite stories from the Islamic traditions, um, and I'll say, like, I say the phrase Islamic traditions um, as a way to sort of um, break apart uh, the the monolithic approach to what um, we can often use with Islam. Um, different pe folks do different things, but for me, that's my personal act, um, and you don't have to do it. That's just something I learned in seminary and appreciate because like every other religious <laughs> tradition, things have been influenced within Islam and the Islamic traditions that have come from culture. And so there, you know, my experience of Islam and my Muslim faith is gonna be different from Thais, it's gonna be different from pages, it's gonna be different from Sanas, it's gonna be different from every single Muslim because it's also tied to my culture and my identity. Um, but to come back to the, that story of uh, the uh, Muslims that are coming in from uh, international Muslims coming in, that they're 
there's an interest in theology, that's a, there's a deep historical seed in the Islamic traditions around that, where there, you know, historically have been public debates on theology. And so I think that there, uh, there's a real sense of relationship and understanding that can come from having conversations around what is shared, what is different. Um, and we, we can have a better sense of our own faith identity when we engage in those conversations um, and are maybe less likely to take from others because we have a sense of who we are. We're more grounded in our values, more grounded in our identities and experiences. Um, and it's not, it's not a loss, um, but it's, we, we gain more about more of an understanding of who we are and what we believe. And I think from a from a religious education standpoint, um, I think often what I see in our religious education curriculum, um, and, and this is changing, but in the past has been a desire to study um, Christianity as, you know, something that somebody else does, and a desire to study Judaism as something that somebody else does, and a desire to study um, Islam is something that somebody else does, as opposed to acknowledging that we have, you know, you, you Muslims, we have you, you Jews, we have you, you Christians, like this is not about some amorphous, um, you know, <laughs> group of, of people that have nothing to do with us as Unitarian Universalists. And, um, you know, as I think as we shift kind of that part of the institution to really recognize that that this is part of who we are, um, that that will also, you know, speak to, um, yeah, that centering of, you know, about us, without us. Um, so I just wanted to get to some of the comments um, from folks out there. So Jacaren said the UU world should be a starting point for sharing the different identities of UUs. That would be awesome if it was also like um, written by some of those folks as well. That'd be great. Um, Ian Hill says yes to relational bridges needing to be built before crisis. That's that's really great. And then um, Ian had a question actually for Paige. How can ministers be relevant to diverse identities to people in widely different social locations? Um, so I'm going to come back to that one page and let you answer that and think on it for a second. Um, Ty uh, said relationships build re relationships build resilience. We have to make sure they are strong and healthy. And whew, I lost my place. Janine said such a good point. Seminary can't be the only place you use or learning about Islamic traditions. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Ian said, uh, I believe it's up to worship leaders who use, you use various sources to talk about Muslim contributions to our faith. It's not just up to educational curriculum, but the stories we can share from the pulpit in the appropriate context with appropriate citations. I love that you put that, that end part on there. <laughs> um, so I want to ask about the book, uh, the proposed book in a minute, but I do want to give um, uh, Paige a chance to answer uh, Ian's uh, question. If, if you want to, you don't have to. Yeah, I, I have to answer Ian's question. Otherwise, I'll be in trouble. So thanks for the question, Ian. Um, so I think one of the ways in which ministers can be relevant to diverse identities is um, I think that breaking away from from the ways in which you are accustomed to, to, to doing your ministerial work is important. I'm an advocate that variety is the spice of life. And, and I think that people, while they gravitate towards stability, also enjoy some variety. Um, I think I, I'm an advocate for, for lay, lay leadership in like a huge, huge way. I um I just went to First Congregational, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of it is First Congregational Church of Oakland. It's a it's a United Church of Christ congregation and, and it's totally lay led. And so inherently every Sunday you're getting 
you're, you're getting a different flavor of, of worship. You're getting a different voice. Um, and so I think something like that would be really interesting. Like what, what would it look like to really just kind of invite people to have, to have more of an active part of, um, of, of various aspects of congregational life that, that may be a little bit outside of the box. Um, I think generally speaking, just like giving people a voice and just like asking like, what would your ideal church experience look like? I think a lot of people go to church and they're like, okay, like this, this is what I get. I'm here. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and, and lastly, I just wanted to, I also wanted to, to say like, um, in terms of, of really getting some of this information out to the masses, I, I just think like we should be doing just like some public education, like throwing together a Zoom panel and having some dope speakers on is totally not hard. And between everybody that's on this call alone, we could, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think the, sometimes the only barriers to, to giving the people what they need and what they want is, is ourselves. And, um, and I feel like people are really thirsty for this, even if they don't know. And so, I mean, what would it look like to have like a monthly webinar on, you know, on Islam, the Muslim UU experience or whatever? Um, we can do whatever we want to do. We don't have to ask for permission or wait for somebody to tell us to do something. Um, so I'll just... I'll, I'll leave with that. Amen, amen. <laughs> um, so I did want to ask uh, Tynan and, and Rama about the proposed, it says proposed Muslim voices in Unitarian Universalism book, and it makes me very, very excited. So I'm, I'm trying to, I've, I've held out until now, so tell, tell more. Um. I can say a little bit and then Ty, if there's anything else. Um, so the, you know, there's the uh, Voices in Unitarian Universalism series. Um, and uh, this is a project that's actually been in the, percolating for some time. It was initially um, myself and Ibrahim Ferjaje from Star King um, who were uh, going to co-edit this text. And then when he um, passed on uh, it, it took a little nap, um, but Tynan has been a part of the sort of uh, the planning process from the beginning. And so it made perfect sense to have him uh, be uh, a co-editor um, in this new iteration. And I'm, we are slowly getting our proposal back together. It was initially um, approved by Skinner House, um, but needed to be re-proposed. Um, and so we're working on getting together that that new proposal um, and we'll hopefully have um, some incredible content uh, from people that have uh, shared sort of their experiences and their perspectives already. Um, you know, uh, there's a, a hopeful virtual component too that um, I know that uh, Ty has been working on. Um, yeah, so hope coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ty, if there's anything else. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that um, definitely, you know, I, I think that it, one of the things that has been a big factor in putting together this, um, this proposal and the, the book is just that, you know, what Ronwa mentioned that we've really had to like rework the proposal. And that is so much about the fact that like the world has gone through some really intense changes for Muslims, especially Muslims in the US um, in the past few years. And that, that's something that like we're really experiencing and holding in a very specific way. Um, and so really having to, to redevelop the proposal with that in mind and also have it not be something that's so uh, time specific that it becomes outdated um, is, a, is a real you know, balancing act. Um, and I, and I also wanted to say a little bit more about the, the, the project that I've been working on with this idea in mind that we haven't had a space where, you know, you could go for resources that are developed or approved <laughs> by Muslim UUs. Um, and also just to find, you know, stories and information, uh, you know, that, that have to do with, with our um, little 
sub community. Um, so I have developed a website which we're going to be populating hopefully with um, you know resources and um, you know more content as we go forward. But it's a starting point for us to actually start to have a place to go, as opposed to just you know not really being sure where to look. Um, so. The website is muslimuu.org and the email address is muslimuu.org at gmail. That's really fantastic. I hope that soon there will be a, a place to donate money to support uh, for those of us who would benefit from such a thing. Um, that would be good too. Um, I was wondering, given the great diversity that Ranwa referenced of culture and theology and place, if, if there's anything about you, you Muslims, that you would identify as the you, you Muslim kind of piece, you know, and, and I, I don't know that that's true with any of the theological groups, so it may not be at all true, but I just wonder, is it cultural or, you know, um, do you see do you see any commonality or any um, any like well yeah there's there's that little you you Muslim edge thing. I I definitely see a particular at least one trait that seems to be common to um, you you Muslims as being very um, comfortable with the idea that the people that we are um, sharing this journey of, of life and sharing our spiritual lives with are not necessarily people that believe exactly the same thing or practice the same thing that we do. Um, and I think that that's why that becomes sort of a, a, a characteristic for this, this group is that, it's it's a that is a trait that is deeply embedded in Unitarian Universalism in its theoretical form, and it's deeply embedded in Islamic tradition as well. Um, you know the idea of religious tolerance, and you know of course that's been lost by many communities at different times, but um, it was definitely something that was embodied by the Prophet Muhammad, and so it's you know I think that that's one of the the traits that is very. Um, very strong within that population. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak sort of from my perspective, which will not necessarily be everybody else's. Um, but for me, one of the, the edges that feels like an intersection is the, um, the call to transform the world like the call to um do divine work and god's will um would be my like my personal theology so to enact god's will of justice and um and community and celebration um in the world um feels like something where there is a, uh, a strong intersection in theory <laughs> um and so that's a that's a place that has been particularly during my seminary process a place that helped me root myself in both my Muslim and Unitarian Universalist identities. Um, and yeah, I, I would echo Ty's piece too, that there's a community in difference and a community in diversity. Um, and I don't want to use those words as buzzwords, but that we are community because we are different in, in a lot of ways. And there's real power and beauty um, in that. We are coming up to the top of the hour, so I wanted to give all of our guests one last opportunity. If there was anything that you really wanted to make sure you said to folks or any words of wisdom that you want to leave, um, I very much you know, want to thank you all for being here, but, but also give you the opportunity to get in anything that, that you were dying to say. I think... I just wanted to jump in um, and mention too that one of the ways I've seen UU Muslim community is after I've preached about being a UU Muslim <laughs> or I've created a space to talk about multiple religious belonging. And then people come up to me and they're like, oh my God, I've always been like this. And I've not had the space to talk about it. I've not had the space to say I'm 
um, you, you Muslim or a multiple religious, uh, I have multiple religious identities. So I think one thing I would like to leave folks with is um, to create spaces where people can talk about having multiple religious belonging in UU spaces, um, you know, so that their first time isn't having an experience with a guest preacher and being like, this is the first time I've said in church that I'm a UU Muslim or a UU Hindu or whatever. Um, those spaces aren't aren't around as much. And I would also open that space with, with an openness to hearing the theological diversity that people bring um, and chat and, you know, challenging the discomfort that comes up in folks who can't under really, aren't able to understand what it means to have more than one identity as a religious person. I'll also add speaking explicitly to um, UU Muslims and Muslims in UU spaces that there is um, a Facebook group that we are slowly growing um, for folks to connect. Um, and hopefully the um, Muslim UU dot, uh, the Muslim UU uh, website will be uh, another place where we can gather. But um, for now we have that community. We're trying to ensure we can connect and see if we can start creating those at least virtual calls, um, potential like online worship. Uh, so if you are interested, there's um, you can reach out to us and we can get you added to that. Hey, Jotina, I've given you the, the last there page. I was trying to be, trying to contemplate a little bit. Um, I wanted to lift up something that Ian said um, in the comments that uh, I think well, worship of the written word um, is a symptom of white supremacy. And I think that culturally there's a tendency for you use to rely to rely on that written word. Um, but it's 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 by far not the only way for us to be able to 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 grow in our understanding. And I would argue should not even be a starting point for that. Um, I think I think that one of the things that we're really that it's like a connecting um, theme that we've been talking about is, is relationships. And I think that growing relationships based on accountability through service is a great way for congregations in particular to try to connect with, um, with marginalized people that they wanna be in community with. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that, um, I'll just say that, uh, I think it's really I think it's really important to use this moment to recognize the importance of doing that self education and really considering um, ways in which you've kind of like been complicit in, in creating such an environment that we're in. Um, and really take your time to do that before you're before you're jumping into action um, and that for you Muslims out there. Clearly, you have, you have folks, you have a family, so let's get in touch and build together. Ten, any last words? Uh, I, I just want to really emphasize again what Paige is saying about relationship. I feel like one of the one of the the strengths and weaknesses of Unitarian Universalism is that it's really based on this idea that we can have different beliefs and sit together and come from different backgrounds and sit together and be working towards the same things. And the weakness is that we frequently aren't being too, we're being too polite about it. We're, we're not actually engaging the conversations of the person sitting next to me. What do you actually believe? What is your actual experience that led you here? And that's so important both within our communities and, and to know how to support you, you Muslims who are all having very unique individual experiences in the world and not, um, sort of a homogenized experience that they might be able to guess at from, from media. Yes, 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 yes to all that and more. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Senna. Thank you, Ranwa. Thank you, Tynan, for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out um, to share. 
Um, next week, we have Julie Taylor from UU Trauma Ministries, which um, we're very excited to, to hear um, from Julie, particularly. We've been hearing a lot about trauma-informed ministry lately, and we thought maybe it'd be good to have a baseline understanding of what that means before it becomes the new buzzword. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all or hearing you all or having you all hear us next week. Bye.